So the first focus topic is basically decisions. Uh, in an economy, decisions have to be made. And the question becomes, how? Why, you know, how are decisions going to be made in a good economy? And uh, what kind of criteria or norm should we have for those decisions in a good economy? I think that the, the guide should be some kind of value or norm for how we think decisions should be made. And so a simple example would be, okay, so there'll be, you know, let's say roughly 100 folks here, and let's make believe that we're some kind of a gathering of 100 folks in some kind of deliberative body. And one decision is whether or not we should be wearing blue or red shirts, or whether or not we should have a picture of our spouse on our desk. And clearly, if we think about that decision, uh, it's not a democracy decision. Everybody here shouldn't be deciding that. It's not a consensus decision. It's actually a dictatorial decision. It's not the case that each of us should have to be tallying a vote of all 100 of us to determine whether or not we should have on blue or black slots. Sometimes decisions, in fact, are made most sensibly by one person. Now assume instead that we're deciding on something uh, that democracy applies. Uh, suppose that the issue was whether or not we should all unmute our screens and play music. Now, clearly, we shouldn't each be making that decision dictatorially. That's a decision that affects everybody. And pretty quickly, I think, uh, we come to what I at least think is a sensible uh, value for decision making, a guiding norm for decision making, and it's called self management. But the idea is that people should have decision making say in proportion to the degree that they're affected, that that's really a goal for the process of deliberation and arriving at decisions that treats everybody with respect and equally. And that doesn't deliver power to people who are unaffected. That's not reasonable. And it doesn't de decrease the power of people who are mightily affected. So that becomes the principle, self-management. And then we have to ask, it's not an institution yet. We haven't solved any institutional problem. But if we do arrive at that, then the question arises, okay, how do we implement that? How do we actually have uh, self-management? And what are the implications of wanting to have self-management? So one implication in the economy is immediately pretty evident. We can't have owners of workplaces. Ownership conveys two things, not one thing. Ownership conveys profits. But ownership also conveys control. And obviously, if you have an owner and he has dominion over our workplace, then we're not going to have self-management. But if we want self-management, then already, first step, Capitalism's gone. We can't have private owners of means of production of workplaces because that will violate self-management. And if we're serious about self-management, then we have to follow the implication seriously. So no owners. There's a second implication. Not only can't you have an owner, but you can't have a group who has disproportionate power, who has more power, more influence over decisions, than is warranted by the degree to which they're affected. If a subset of people has that, then another subset of people has less. And if we believe in self-management, we are violating it again. So this turns out to be a trivially simple observation, which is incredibly powerful. If we're gonna have self-management in a workplace, that means workers are gonna have decision-making input that's in accord with, that closely corresponds to uh, the degree to which they're affected by decisions. Well, where are they going to have that input? That's what leads to the idea of a workers' council. And it's a venue where it's possible for the workers to participate and to exert self-managing say. So we have a, a beginning of a picture. We have said that we like the idea of self-management. We like the idea of people having a say in decisions to the portion they're affected. We like the idea of workers' councils and consumers' councils. And that means we don't like the idea of an owner of the workplace who has dominion over it or of a group, less than the workforce, that has dominion over it. So at this point, 
Uh, we're going to invite somebody who's not in the room to enter the room, Margaret Thatcher. So Margaret Thatcher is now with us, I guess, in ghostly form. And Thatcher, you remember, said, Tina, there is no alternative. She really believed is there is no better alternative. So Tinba, because of course there are alternatives. There's an alternative to what we have now. Uh, we could all just starve to death. And in fact, that was Thatcher's point. Thatcher's point was any alternative to capitalism, any alternative to the system which now works, however flawed, however much damage it's doing, however much harm it's doing, any alternative to it, worse. So there's no point in thinking about an alternative because no better alternative is possible. Maybe she wouldn't start in with self-management right off, but I think she would start in, she would be horrified by the notion of self-management. She would say, uh, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Self-management uh, denies expertise. There is such a thing as expertise. There is such a thing as people um, knowing more about particular issues. So what's the response to that? Uh, my response to that is that there's nothing about self-management that in any way conflicts with paying attention to expertise. We should take into account the expertise, but we should not give to the expert control we need to know what these expert opinions are. But there's nothing about self-management that in any way says we should not pay attention to expertise. It just says expertise does not justify or warrant having, let's call it, more votes, uh, more say, more influence in decisions. There arises another problem. What about expertise in making decisions? What about if uh, Sarah is really, really good at decision making. In fact, she's the best decision maker by miles, by a long shot in this group. What about then? Certainly self-management does interfere with our having Sarah make most or all of the decisions based upon her expertise in decision making. That's true. It does interfere with that. So. The response is twofold. One is, there's no such thing. That is, it is not the case, assuming we are in a good society and a good economy and people are prepared and confident and able, there's no such thing as somebody who is always the best decision maker. That's a weak response, but it's, it's valid, I think. It would be enough for me. But there's another response, which is that Sarah is, in fact, not the best expert in the group about something very important. Suppose I asked, who is the world's best expert at your preferences? The real answer, of course, is you are. You are the world's best expert at your preferences. And there are two parts to decision making. One part is deliberation and discussion and the exploration of the issues. And the other part is expressing preferences and having those preferences influence the outcome. Self-management not only respects uh, expertise in the sense of or already discussed, but also in the sense of tallying preferences. We give people the world's best experts the option or the right or the responsibility to uh, deliver their own votes in, in the situation. And then whatever tactic we convince, whether we adopt, whether it be consensus or dictatorship or democracy, uh, various possibilities make sense. So we come to a new problem, and this is a serious problem, I think. The next one is, Thatcher says, wait a minute, Michael, is one thing to, for you to say that you're going to consult expertise? Okay, I'll give you that. It's one thing for you to get cute and say that everybody is a best expert on their own preferences. I'll even give you that. But it's not the case that everybody is comparably prepared and able to participate in decision making. If I go into the, the, you know, the factory around the corner and I um, consider the possibility that everybody is going to have a say in decisions, all the workers are going to have a say, it seems to me that we're going to get some bad decisions because people just aren't prepared for that. They aren't equipped. They aren't confident. They don't have the social skills. They don't have the kind of broad knowledge and so on 
that is essential to be able to make decisions. Well, I think that's a legitimate concern, but that concern does something that almost every good concern in trying to create a new economy or to conceive a new economy is going to do. It raises another question for us. How do we deal with that? How do we make it the case that instead of people being unprepared, people are prepared? Instead of lots of people being not good and perhaps making bad decisions, everybody being able and prepared and inclined to make good decisions. And so that's the next question that we'll deal with in the next section. Let me just say one more word about it. What's the virtues of self-management? Well, if we really believe in self-management, then we don't believe in capitalism. We also don't believe in patriarchy and racial denigration and all the rest of it. But we're mainly talking about the economy today. More importantly, we don't believe in any other kind of hierarchy of power. And it treats everybody alike and thereby minimizes alienation. So our next step in the next section is going to be how to deal with everybody becoming a good decision maker and how to deal with everybody, you know, not being disinclined even to make decisions, um, but inclined to do so and prepared to do so. And the second issue is, okay, Thatcher said, uh, look, it sounds groovy, but we'll all suffer immeasurably because there'll be bad decisions because not everybody is going to be in position to be sensible about decision making. And I think that's a fair concern, people being ready for self-management. So suppose we look at the economy and we look at what we have right now and we look inside of a workplace and this could be a workplace in the United States today or wherever you want. If we look, we see something that's called corporate division of labor. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if we look at the jobs that exist inside workplaces, we see something I think interesting. The interesting thing isn't the very detailed specifics of each job. It's that we can broadly speaking group jobs into two categories or two types. One type of job is such that the person doing it, by virtue of doing it, uh, receives information, knowledge, has interactions with others, develops certain social skills, develops a degree of confidence. We can call these things empowering aspects of life. But then there's another kind of job, another set of jobs in this division of labor, the second kind of job, doing it diminishes your knowledge of the overall situation. It, it reduces your ties to others, your social connections, and your social skills in some sense. It reduces your confidence. It bores, it involves obedience, subordination, your access to levers of decision making, it reduced to nil. And the first kind of job, you do have access to levers of decision making. We have these two broad categories of work, empowering work and disempowering work. And now if we ask about what the implication of that is for self-management, I think it becomes pretty clear. The implication is the disempowering work reduces the inclination, the disposition, the preparedness to participate in decision making. And the empowering work does the opposite. And the result of that is that we have, and now if we look again at that categorization of jobs, we discover very interestingly that about 20%, roughly speaking, are empowering and 80% are disempowering. And so if we look at that, we think to ourselves, okay, now we've got a group of 20% and we've got a group of 80%. Uh, so we call the 80% the working class. That's the people who are working inside firms and they are disempowered by the activity that they are doing. We call the 20%, I'll call them the coordinator class. So we have a 20% coordinator class and an 80% working class, roughly speaking. Does it matter any more than that? And the answer is it does. And why does it matter any more than more that? Well, Thatcher told us because the 80% are not ready 
and prepared and decline and inclined to participate and make decisions and the 20% are. And so what happens? Well, now let me tell you a, a story about a trip I made to Argentina. Uh, when the Argentine factories were taken over in large numbers, um, so there were a few hundred factories taken over. They typically were taken over by the workforce because they were failing and the workers were taking over the factory because unlike the capitalists who just simply moved on and was gonna make their profit someplace else, the workers had no place to go. But the coordinator class inside the factory, the engineers, the managers, various people whose work was empowering, they looked at the capitalists packing up and they decided I'm going too. Without the capitalists, this is gonna fail. And so I'm getting out of here also. So they left also. So what happened is the working class participants in the workplaces, the 80%, took over these factories. And they met and they discussed and they decided to try and run the factories because they wanted to continue their lives for one thing. Uh, and they, they almost immediately formed what? Workers' councils, right? That was automatic. They immediately knew, look, we're in charge, so we need this venue. So they took the first step, no, no problem. They also did some other things. They tended to equalize wages, and they tend to introduce immediately democracy, and in some cases, something much more closer to, to self-management. And then they operate. And so I'm in Argentina, and I'm in a meeting, and there's about 50 people there, and they're from factories all over Argentina. Uh, then somebody went and said, we took over the workplace. We instituted full democracy. We had our, our, our council. We equalized our wages. We battled against alienation. And it's six or seven months later, and all the old crap is coming back. And I said, well, wait a second. When you took over your workplace, did you maintain the old jobs that existed in your workplace? And then they said, well, of course we did. Well, you know, what else were we going to do, right? And then we talked about how it was that a subset of those jobs empowered people and a subset disempowered people. And so despite the fact that the person who was now doing the accounting in the firm had been a worker, that person now was much more confident. That person now knew what was going on all over the workplace. And basically what we were discovering was that all the old crap was coming back because the old division of labor was creating a class division in the workplace between a coordinator class and a working class. And the coordinator class was starting to do things like increase its own wages because it looked around and it said to itself, I'm making the decisions, I'm more important, I'm smarter, I'm more responsible, I deserve more. And so all the old crap was coming back because this class division, it was out with the old boss, the owner, in with the new boss, the coordinator class. So what do you do about this? In the transition, let's call it, from a capitalist firm or a coordinator class firm in which you have the same division of labor inside the workplace. What do you have to do to move from that to what we want? A classless situation to a situation where there's real self-management. Well, the answer is share the empowering work. And so the second step, I think, is you have to get rid of the corporate division of labor so you don't have a coordinator class that dom dominates. And so what does that mean? You have to redefine jobs in such a way that each job in a workplace each job in the economy, uh, has attributes that are comparably empowering for that job to the attributes that other jobs have. So when we go into the workplace, we are all comparably empowered, comparably prepared to develop our ideas of what we want, to develop agendas, to argue for them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's a lot of implications of this, obviously, we call them balanced job com, or I call them balanced job complexes. So it's in practice, it's that kind of thing. In a hospital, you no longer have the hospital administrators, the surgeons, and people cleaning up after everybody. 
You have to have jobs which are comparably empowering to all who are occupying those jobs. And likewise, across the whole economy. What's the problem? Thatcher now is having an embolism. She's saying, are you crazy? You're saying that a surgeon who's currently working 30 hours a week or 40 or 50 hours a week doing surgery, if surgery is empowering, then they have to do less of that. And we're going to lose a lot of surgery. You're consigning us to death in order to have self-management. We'll be self-managing death. There is no alternative. And she'd be right if it was true. So it's a legitimate concern to raise. And so what's the answer? On the one hand, of course, it implies more training. But the bigger thing that it implies is the idea that 20% are capable of empowering work, 80% are not. 80% are just not capable of it. They need to be cared for by the 20%. That's one of the attributes of coordinator class consciousness, a kind of paternalism. That's the underlying assumption. In any case, the claim of participatory economics is that the 80% can certainly do empowered work, that each person can do a mix of responsibilities and tasks, which has comparably empowering effects. It, it just means that we can all do, do a balanced job and then participate in the workplace. The message of this section, I guess, is that we have rejected an economy in which the coordinator class becomes the new ruling class. We have said that that should not be the case. That violates classlessness, and it also violates self-management. It achieves classlessness, at least so far, and it has implications, for example, for education, for all kinds of things that are quite profound. So this would be the third issue. Decisions, uh, distribution of work, how we do our work. And now we come to this problem of the pie, how we divide things up, not the system, not the allocation system, but what do we, what do we want? What, what do we really want? Economists tell us that one way to, to determine income is that you get what your property produces. If you get everything that your property produces, if you get back um, based on your property's production, that will lead to the injustice that that is, but also to a violation of self-management. The second norm is power. I actually think this one is quite operative and even dominant in market systems. You get what you can take, and that's in fact exactly what a bargaining power is. And now comes one that lots of socialists support. You should get back from the pie, the social pie that's produced in society, you should get back a piece that represents or is in accord with or is proportional to the amount you contribute to the pie. And the argument is relatively simple. If I get less than I contributed, somebody else is getting some of mine. And if I get more than I put in, then I'm getting some of somebody else's. And the socialist who supports this says that's unjust. We've got it. This is our norm for uh, remuneration. And if this is our norm for remuneration, we would then have to figure out a institution which fulfills the norm. I don't think this is a good norm at all. What it does is it rewards you for things about which you had nothing to do with. The results of that stuff is wide disparities of income, which will lead to wide disparities of power, which will violate self-management, and which will lead to a redefining of work by those with the greater power. It, it will corrupt all of what we've been doing. And also it's wrong because I think it's immoral. So what do we do then? If we don't reward the output that a person generates, what do we reward? I think we reward how long people work, how hard people work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which people work as long as they're doing something that's socially valued. That last phrase is very, very important. As long as we're contributing to the social pie, we get income for duration, intensity, and onerousness. That seems to me to be ethically sound. Those on the bottom have the least bargaining power. So they not only get the least income, they work the longest and they work the hardest and they have the worst conditions. 
But if we change things so that uh, remuneration was for equitable, was for duration, intensity, and onerousness, then those on the bottom would be earning the most. Now, in a participatory economy, it wouldn't mean that because there wouldn't be anybody on the bottom. We'd have balanced job complexes, and that would tend to make that situation much different. But in a participatory economy, people would get remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerous. So if you work a little longer because you want to get a brand new violin that's really very expensive because you play violin, right? So you decide you want to work a little longer, that's okay. Or maybe you value leisure more. You've got enough stuff, you'd rather work less long. Fine. In a participatory economy, you get to make that choice. Thatcher re-enters the room. She would in fact say it won't work. If it's the case that you can earn as much and you will earn as much, and maybe you will even earn more in different jobs than like being a doctor, you won't be a doctor. So what she would say is your incentives make no sense. You do not incentivize what society needs. You're proposing something that will cause us to have no medicine, no doctoring. We will lose uh, too much because people won't want to do these things. My answer to that is imagine that you're just about to get out of high school and you're now making a choice. Maybe I'm going to become a doctor. Thatcher is saying uh, you opt for the coal mine because the incentives are warped and will cause you to opt for the coal mine instead of to pursue being a doctor. Um, I say that's not true. First of all, we have balanced job complexes, but let's set that aside for a moment and see whether or not it really is the case, what we have to incentivize. I say, okay, let's assume that um, when you become a doctor, you'll earn $500,000 a year. And if you go into the coal mine, you'll earn $50,000 a year. And so I say, I want you to think now, I'm going to start lowering the salary and you tell me when you would forego going to college because it's so onerous compared to being in a coal mine, going to medical school because it's so onerous compared to being in a coal mine, and being a intern, you know, in a, the, the early doctor because it's so onerous, and then being a doctor if as I start lowering the salary. And I do this with the people, and I'll say 500,000, 400,000, 300,000, 200,000. Nobody's changing. Nobody is saying, okay, I'll forgo being a doctor and I'll, I'll work in the coal mine. And finally, somebody will raise their hands and say, or her hand and say, how low can I go and still survive? Because there's no way that I'm going into the coal mine uh, unless I can't survive and I have to go there. I'll be the doctor even for the low pay. And what it reveals is you don't need an incentive for people to do certain things. You need the incentive for people to exert themselves for the duration and the intensity and the onerousness that they're willing to endure. And so participatory economics not only delivers equity, where we define equity, this is a value, we're defining it. We're saying equity is you get remuneration uh, in accord with your duration, intensity, and onerousness of work. So if you don't get that, it's inequitable. And we're also saying that it incentivizes that which you can affect. If I give you more because you have luck in the genetic endowment, it doesn't matter how much I give you. You can't change what your genes are. So there, there is no positive incentive effects of remunerating for property that causes people to want more property and to try and get it and to then try to maximize the income, the profits they get from it, or power that causes people to try and accrue power to take more. That's not a good incentive effect. And even output, it has one incentive effect that looks good on the face of it, training, right? But if we pay for training and is a social good because it's in fact producing more skills and more knowledge and therefore it's work and you get paid to do it rather than paying others for it, then you no longer need the incentive. There is another view of remuneration. You should get for need and you should contribute for ability. So you, you work according to ability and you receive income according to need. I don't think that is good for various reasons and I'll just provide two. Well, if I can have what I need and it's not a bad thing to take what I need, then I want a yacht. 
And there's nothing wrong with it because the norm is that I should get for my need. So there's a problem here. And if I can work to my ability, there's two problems on that side. One, I can say, I don't have any ability. I don't want to work. Or alternatively, I could say, look, my ability is to play baseball shortstop and I want to be the shortstop of the Yankees. And both are bad. One underproduces and the other one underproduces because what I would be doing would be worthless because I'm not good at shortstop. So on both sides, as there's a problem. And finally, there's a problem with the economy not knowing what to do. Suppose we produce something and we get back a communication that a lot of people want. This norm would give us that, right? People say what they want, but we would get no information about how much they want it. And if we have no information about how much we want, they want it, we don't know whether it makes sense to produce. In summary, we rule out property income, we rule out power income, we rule out output income because it leads to huge disparities, because we are not all the same in all ways. And we rule out uh, income for need, not for those who can't work. For those who can't work, we do have income for need, but for those who can work, we have income for duration, intensity, and onerousness of work. And the virtue is that it's equitable and it simultaneously incentivizes what should be incentivized, doing that which contributes to the social product within your ability to do so, within your power to do so. So allocation is the most complex aspect of economic life. Um, and allocation is basically um, what's the process? What are the set of institutions and the process that permits or facilitates or forces the economy to arrive at the inputs and outputs, the stuff that's produced and the stuff that's consumed, stuff that's used in the process for the whole society? The existing options for allocation are basically markets and central planning. So markets is basically a allocation mechanism in which actors exchange, they buy and sell, and they compete. They determine the relative valuation of things, prices, and they determine the outcomes. Instead of that, central planners ask the population for some information, receive it, send down a plan, and ask for some response and receive that, and send down a plan, and now they receive obedience. And so those are the two predominant systems. So I think both central planning and markets are disgusting. First of all, they immediately violate self-management. They immediately violate remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness of work. They do impose class division. So with central planning, it's much easier to see. <clears throat> the central planners are clearly above the rest in some sense. They're making um, crucial decisions that affect people's lives, et cetera, et cetera. But the central planners have to communicate with the rest of the economy. And the central planners, the last thing they want to do is communicate with a workers' council in which the workers have balanced job complexes and therefore are empowered, confident, and know what the hell they want. Central planners aren't interested in that. So they want a layer of power inside the workplaces. So what happens is in this kind of situation, you have, again, the coordinated class working class distinction. And you have uh, the Bolsheviks destroying uh, the workers' councils. OK, what about uh, markets? Markets is more subtle. Suppose we take over companies. We set up workers and consumers councils. We institute balanced job complexes. We have self-managing decision-making inside all these units, right? And now we connect everything with markets. And what happens? What happens, I think, is something like this. Consider we're, we're such a workplace. We manufacture bicycles. And because we're operating on the market, we have to compete for market share. And that has certain implications. Uh, as we sit around in our council and decide whether or not to institute daycare, a lot of us will say yes. 
But some of us will say, hold on just a minute. I heard that the bicycle factory over on the other side of town is not instituting daycare. And if we institute it, they're going to outcompete us. And when they outcompete us, eventually we're going to go out of business. And so we'll be sitting here with our balanced job complexes and equitable remuneration and full self-management and no income. And so what do we have to do? We have to use speed up. We have to do various things that make us better able to generate bicycles and advertisements about bicycles in order to increase our share of the market. And none of us want to do that. And so what do we do? We look for people to employ whose education and socialization and conception is such that they will be okay with making decisions that hurt us in the workplace. As long as we bring them in and we don't make them subject to the decisions. So we give them air-conditioned offices, reasonable circumstances, we give them higher pay, and then we say, okay, fuck us, so that we can compete with the other firms that are doing this. And so markets have a tendency to reintroduce the coordinator class working class distinction. Okay, so if we rule out central planning and markets, what the hell do we do? Allocation has to be a process in which workers and consumers councils are communicating with one another and are moving toward a plan. So it's a kind of a decentralized planning. Uh, we call it participatory planning. And then you have to have clarity about how that happens. What is it um, that causes the rounds of decentralized planning in which workers and consumers councils are making proposals and then are hearing each other's proposals and then are refining their proposals in light of the feedback with an eye on what? On income, on well being, on their fulfillment, et cetera. Why does it come to a conclusion? And does it take everything into account? What does it have to take into account? Well, when we value something, we have to take into account the full social, ecological, and personal implications. So we need an allocation system that does that. We need an allocation system which delivers to the participants a degree of self-managing say. And we need to deliver an allocation system which doesn't create a class division, then disrupting everything that we believe in. And if we can deliver an allocation system like that, and I think we can, and I think it is called participatory planning, participatory economics is not all that complicated when you get right down to it. It's workers and consumers self-managing councils. It's balanced job complexes, it's equitable remuneration, and it's participatory planning. Is that a whole economy? No. On top of that, there will be all kinds of features that emerge from the practical experience that we gain as we fight for and then institute a new kind of economy. Participatory economics will have more features, but what makes it participatory economics, I think, is those four things. Um,